conversations and civil dialogue. My name is Curry Sautner and I'll be your host today with Jeff Rosen, our top scholar at the National Constitution Center. He is also our president and CEO there. And it is a great week to kick off these classes. And if you're watching this anytime throughout the year, it is always a great time to talk about the Constitution and to talk about civil dialogues. Real quick before we get started, a couple of things. We love to talk to you. We love to have civil dialogues. And to do it this way, we need to open up that chat box. So the chat should be at the bottom of your page or the top. Open it up. Let us know where you're coming from. If you're working with students, always feel free to sign your name and then we can make sure that we talk right back to you and answer your question directly. So without further ado, I want to introduce Jeff Rosen and let's get started on constitutional conversations, Jeff. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. So great to see you. And Curry, where should we start? So I always like to start with what the National Constitution Center's big idea is behind constitutional conversations. Now, when we teach these and all this entire year, every single week, we're going to be having a constitutional conversation. So how do we come up with the stories that we tell and how do we look at the questions that we ask our students? And then how do we ask our students to engage in dialogue? So Jeff, can you go over kind of our educational framework real quick for the students and for the teachers so they know this is a great way to have a constitutional conversation with us or at their dinner table or with their friends or on Zoom, wherever they may be Zooming and YouTubing this year. Absolutely. So friends, it is so important to learn how to have constitutional rather than political conversations. We all know how polarized politics are today. It's tough to talk to about friends who disagree and no one's gonna convince each other about politics. Uh, people tend to have their minds made up. But when it comes to the constitution, we can listen respectfully to each other. We can uh, learn uh, about text and history and precedent and all sorts of uh, ways that people have interpreted the constitution before. And in the process, we can open our minds to the good arguments on all sides of constitutional questions and sometimes even change our minds. So how do we learn to do that? First, we build a historical foundation through storytelling. I can't get you interested in a constitutional question unless I tell stories. So let's start getting specific. Uh, let's pick a question that's relevant to your lives right now. Can your principal or teacher search your backpack once we all get back to school after this COVID crisis lifts? Because uh, they think you might have some uh, cigarettes in the backpack. Well, that's a question the Supreme Court has decided in a case called uh, uh, Reading and Stafford School District. So we, we can talk about what the Supreme Court has said, but it's interesting already by just raising a question like that, you wanna know more. Whose backpack was searched in that case? What happened to uh, the uh, young girl who's uh, had such an intrusive search and what did the court say? But in order to answer the question of whether that backpack search was constitutional or not, we have to tell uh, historical stories about what the Fourth Amendment means. So the Fourth Amendment, as Curry's slide here says, the policy question in this case is, should a public school principal uh, be able to search a student's locker? That's different from the constitutional question, which is, does the Fourth Amendment allow a government employee, like a public school teacher, to search a backpack? So the political question, you know, that would be a sort of a question of your policy instincts. Yes, we've got to have more discipline in school or no, you shouldn't be intruding on students' freedom. The constitutional question is different. What does the Fourth Amendment, which says the right of the people to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, what does that language mean? So to get to, to start that question, and Curry, maybe we can go back to the kind of uh, historical yeah. uh, storytelling uh, slide. There you go. I, there we go. I have to build a historical foundation through storytelling about the Fourth Amendment. I already told you a story about uh, the, the young uh, student whose backpack was searched. Now I have to tell you, why did the framers pass that inspiring language about unreasonable searches and seizures to begin with? And when we talk about the Fourth Amendment in this uh, class, I'll tell you the story of the writs of assistance and uh, general warrants that the king's agents use to search the houses of people who criticized King George before the American Revolution to look to see if they'd written pamphlets that criticized him or to search their desk drawers to see if they'd paid the hated 
tea taxes that sparked the American Revolution. So I hope those are such exciting stories you want to know more. And that would be the way in for us to start talking about the framework behind which the constitutional text was ratified. All right, that's that's all that's a lot of stories already. I told you the story about Samantha Redding, and I told you the story about the general warrants and writs of assistance. Um, shall I go on to uh, learning to, to the second two pillars, Curry, or do you want to yeah, talk about storytelling? One of the things that um, our students were asking um, over the summer and before were, how do constitutional lawyers kind of interpret those parts of the constitution? Like, where do those ideas come? Like, we have like six forms of constitutional arguments. We talked briefly about this last year and students wanted to learn a little bit more about how constitutional lawyers work. And because we're asking them in a way in these classes to think like a constitutional lawyer and to set up these questions and putting the political question in one side and the constitutional question in the other. So do, can you kind of walk the, do like a story walk through these like six form of, of arguments? Because all of our students know to get a good grade in their classes and our teachers are hearing it too, they need to be able to really formulate an argument well. And we're asking them to do a constitutional argument. Completely. Um, friends, this is so meaningful to be able to talk to you about how to have a constitutional arguments and about these six forms of constitutional arguments. I, I am a law professor, so I teach constitutional law to second year students. Um, it's advanced constitutional law. And we start with these six forms of constitutional arguments. So I'm uh, encouraging you to do exactly what law students do. And I have confidence that you can do it because I know how engaged and attentive you are. And let's call these the six, uh, what we call them the forms of constitutional arguments. You could also call them methodologies of, of constitutional interpretation. These are the different methodologies that judges use and Supreme Court justices use when they decide constitutional questions. So before we jump in, let's, let's first remind ourselves, we're talking here about constitutional questions, not political questions. We're not asking, is it a good idea for your school principal to be able to search your backpack, but does the constitution allow or forbid it? And it's possible that you might decide that that backpack search is a really intrusive, terrible idea, but the fourth amendment allows it. Or you could think the backpack search is a terrible idea, but the fourth amendment forbids it. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? But by separating your political from your constitutional views, you end up elevating the question above politics. Now we have to decide how do you interpret the constitution? Well, as uh, in all things when it comes to the constitution, judges and justices don't agree about the right methodology. In the news, you will hear uh, there's a difference between uh, originalist judge and judges who favor a living constitution. What do those phrases mean? An originalist judge is supposed to be a judge who interprets the constitution in light of its text and original understanding at the time that it was proposed and ratified. By contrast, a judge who favors a living constitution is supposed to believe that we should ask uh, what, how the constitution should be interpreted today to meet the needs of society in the here and now, rather than asking what people thought in the 18th or 19th century. That's a very crude take on constitutional interpretation to starkly distinguish between originalists and living constitutionalists. And I want you to be more sophisticated and to dig into these six forms of constitutional arguments which are actually uh, capture more precisely how real judges approach these questions. These six forms um, come from a scholar called Philip Bobbitt, who's written a really, uh, some really fascinating books about constitutional interpretation. And let's run through the, the six methods. First is text. The interpreter looks to the meaning of the constitution's words, relying on the common understanding of what the words meant at the time the language was added to the constitution. So if we're talking about the fourth amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, we would ask what is a person or a house or a paper or an effect in 1787 when the constitution was proposed or uh, uh, when it was uh, ratified uh, a, a few years later? Um, we would ask about what the, what the text meant to an ordinary interpreter. Then, then there's the question of history. Here we look to the historical context of when the text was drafted and ratified to shed light on its meaning. In other words, we don't just ask what would a reasonable observer make of the words persons, houses, papers, or effects in 1787, but we look at the historical stories that gave rise to the Fourth Amendment. We tell the story of 
the writs of assistance and we might tell more particular stories like cr critics of King George, like John Wilkes, who uh, drafted the seditious or critical pamphlets of King George that led to the invasive search that sparked the American Revolution. So already, this is a really interesting division, isn't it? You can be a textualist, and that's different from being an originalist. A textualist looks just at what the text means without looking at history. An originalist says, what does it mean when it was originally proposed and ratified? And then to get even more um, uh, deep, uh, we'd ask, really, if uh, forced to choose, we care more about what the ratifiers thought, not what the people who proposed it thought. The proposers, that is James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and all those guys in the picture uh, next to the PowerPoint, that's Ben Franklin sitting with uh, the Pennsylvania delegation um, who ratified the constitution. When they proposed it, they were just making a suggestion to the people of the United States. It wasn't until the constitution was ratified in the name of we the people that it got the force of Supreme Law. So we care about what the ratifiers thought, not what the, what the proposers thought and originalists ask what the uh, ordinary public meaning would have meant uh, to the ratifiers at the time of ratification. Now, structure. Um, it's not just the words of the Constitution that matter, although those are crucial, but what are the structures that the Constitution creates and what principles emanate from them? Checks and balances, separation of powers, these basic ideas, there are three branches of government, the Congress, the judiciary, the executive. Um, power is divided among the three branches horizontally and also divided vertically between the federal government and the states. Those separation of powers and checks and balances reflect the framers' belief in the principle of we the people of being sovereign. And we can infer from the structures they created, like federalism, like separation of powers, their devotion to popular sovereignty and their reluctance to allow any one branch to speak in the name of we the people. Uh, instead, all the branches had to agree before they could claim to speak in the people's name. Uh, we just got a few more, but friends, I have to tell you, we're, this is like the really four minute version of all of constitutional law. So it's, it's, it's worth I, uh, going I, through it. You feel better, Jeff. Tom um, was speaking earlier, one of our other scholars, and they made him do it in two minutes. So oh. you're getting so much longer. And I'm asking everybody in the chat box, which you know, you, would, you can be more than one. You can be, have, be a text and a history person. You can be an ethos person. Um, but which one do you kind of line up with the most? It would rise to the top, but then it really makes me want to create a quiz where you can answer all these constitutional questions and find out which what how much percentage of you is in each one. So Samantha is definitely a text and history person, just to share with you. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that, Samantha. And Curry is absolutely right. You can mix and match. You could be a um, uh, prudential textualist who thinks the text is really important, but it's also important to consider the consequences of a particular ruling. Or you could be a, a textualist who doesn't care about prudence. Friends, that was the very dispute in the one of the biggest Supreme Court cases last year, the Bostock case about whether Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 bans uh, when it says it, you can't discriminate because of sex, does that include because of LGBTQ status? And six justices led by Justice Gorsuch said, yes, LGBTQ discrimination is covered by the words because of sex. They were just looking at the text. The dissenters wanted to look at um, both the context, including the history of the act, and also the prudential consequences. They thought it would be very disruptive to include LGBTQ status because Congress had refused to do so. And that's a debate among justices who are often considered conservative. Uh, so you could mix and match in that way. And it's, um, that's what justices of themselves do. I skipped over doctrine, but that means what has the Supreme Court said about this question in the past? In the LGBTQ case, the Supreme Court had not previously ruled that um, LGBTQ status was covered, but they had said that uh, because of sex uh, included gender discrimination. And Justice Gorsuch thought that that precedent helped support his conclusion that LGBTQ status was covered. And finally, ethos. What about our history, traditions, our practices? Basically, um, you know, if, if uh, the court and American government has presumed that the administrative state, namely all those agencies like the Food and Drug Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency, that those are consistent with the constitution for a long period of time, then someone who cares about ethos might conclude that that's 
valid and relevant in interpreting the Constitution, even though as an original understanding matter, those agencies might have been unconstitutional. By contrast, an originalist might say, I don't care about ethos. I don't care about practice. I don't care about these uh, pragmatic or prudential consequences. I'm going to strike down the administrative state and let the heavens fall. Okay, that's my like six minute version, maybe seven minute version, but there's much more to say. And friends, is it, isn't it so exciting, isn't it? Because having to choose which methodology you like, and then let's see some more comments. Prudence is a big one for, for nice Mike, anyone else, it's a really hard pick. I keep getting more. Yes, I mean, all of these seem like really um, valid considerations for interpreted. Um, Norman says a living, breathing constitution not restricted merely to what a bunch of old white men felt in 1787 circumstances changed. There was no Facebook when the right of privacy was first thought about by Brandeis. There certainly wasn't, Norman, and you're right. Uh, it's hard to ask what the framers would have thought of Facebook because for them, it was government that was the big controller of speech, not private companies. So, but here's the one thing I wanna say, and we've gotta talk about civil dialogue too. This is just whetting our appetite for all the conversations to come. Be principled. You can be a prudential textualist or you can be a doctrinalist, or you can be someone who cares about uh, living, breathing constitution because of um, ethos, but be willing to accept the consequences of that methodology even when you don't like them as a policy matter. Let me give you a concrete example. You might embrace a very expansive conception of autonomy that uh, leads you to conclude that the right to choose abortion is protected by the constitution and that Roe v. Wade was correctly decided. But if you choose that, you have to be open to the possibility that the same principle of autonomy, which is not written down in the text of the constitution, might forbid the government from passing the Obamacare healthcare mandate because forcing people to buy health insurance also violates their autonomy. There, those two conclusions point in opposite directions politically, but they both are arguably compelled or at least suggested by a very abstract devotion to autonomy. And similarly, I could give an example of other methodologies that point in different directions. So be principled, That's, you have, we have the luxury of doing it. We're not judges, we're students of the constitution. The only thing that hangs on our decisions is our intellectual integrity, our devotion to reason, our consistency, our, our willingness to be principled. So we have this great luxury of being able to take the consequences of our, our methodologies. And I want you to do that throughout our discussions. So a question that we had, we were talking about when looking at the constitution. So we just looked at ways to interpret the constitution and we're thinking about constitutional conversations and asking those big constitutional questions about what may the government do, what can the government do and referencing back to the constitution. I know we asked our younger students this question and I wanted to kind of throw it out there to everybody. Um, what do you, when we talk about these, it's not just about, you know, article one or article two or article three, it's about the, the ideas and principles enshrined in the constitution. So what I wanted to kind of throw out, and I know we can't pick favorites, Jeff, but sometimes we do. <laughs> um, what are, I wanted to ask the students about what do you think are some of the most important ideas and principles enshrined in the constitution and why? And Jeff, I figured I'd start with you because um, it's always good to see model it. And so for, for you, when we think of ideas, like when we talk to the kids about the preamble, in the opening line of the constitution. Um, and you know, and we do really quickly in every single class do what we refer to as like a constitution walkabout. We look at the preamble, we look at article one, two, and three really quickly. All of this is on the interactive constitution gang and I put it in the chat box, but I can add it to you, add it for you for others. All these different ideas and beliefs in there what is kind of some of the big important ideas that the students should take away over the course of this year around principles of the constitution? Jeff, and then I'm gonna turn it to the chat box because they're starting to fill it up. <laughs> uh, great, well, Curry, you asked to start with the preamble, so let's do that and let's start with the very first three words of the constitution. We all know what they are. We, the people. What is the significance of that big idea? Well, it's the idea of popular sovereignty. We the people are sovereign. We rule. The king is not sovereign. The president is not sovereign. Congress is not sovereign. The courts are not sovereign. The state governments are not sovereign. This is a radical idea because after all in Britain the king was sovereign. The king in parliament um, as uh, was the 
custom by the time of the revolution. Um, today in Britain, Parliament is sovereign. The, 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 the queen herself is, does not have the power. She's a figurehead. Parliament can do what it uh, likes um, and has the ultimate authority. Um, at the time of the Articles of Confederation, the states were sovereign. But it was the idea of many framers, but perhaps the most influential was a lesser known framer called James Wilson of Pennsylvania, who came up with in the United States, we the people as a whole are sovereign. And that means that uh, so much follows from that, uh, including the fact that states can't secede from the union unilaterally. When Lincoln said states had no power to secede, he invoked James Wilson and said, because we the people of the United States as a whole made the constitution, we the people of the United States as a whole have to agree before it can be uh, changed or uh, altered and the union can be uh, disturbed. And, this, and then another huge idea that falls from we the people as a whole being sovereign, and I know I have to stop Curry because we, we <laughs> this is just the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg. <laughs> The whole idea of judicial review comes from the idea of popular sovereignty. What's judicial review? The power of courts to strike down unconstitutional laws. Where can we learn about that? In Federalist 78 by Alexander Hamilton. What does Hamilton say in Federalist 78? He says, when there's a conflict between the will of the people represented by the constitution and the will of our legislators embodied in ordinary statutes, we prefer the principal to the agent, the boss to the servant. As, as, as he put it. Um, in other words, a law passed by Congress does not represent the will of we the people. It represents the will of our servants and legislators. Only the constitution represents the will of we the people because it was ratified by this special procedure and it was really had to jump through a lot of hoops before uh, it could gain the status of Supreme Law. So that all, you know, that was a, a lot, but that all just stems from the very first words of the constitution, we the people, and that certainly is one of uh, the important ideas and principles that are enshrined there. So here's a couple. So Alyssa said separation of powers and checks and balances, equal protection under the law of 14th Amendment, due process. Oh, this is Lisa um, from above. And then here's another one, which I absolutely love, is from Mike, that the Constitution is a limited, is lim it has a limitation on the powers of the state, not granting rights to the people. Ryan says to promote the general welfare, good call to the preamble there, Ryan, nice job. Kate says the idea that it first gives power then takes power away from each branch. I love that. Henry says, we the people, it is the most important part since the constitution wasn't ratified by the people, it was merely by another federal law. The idea of popular sovereignty is huge. And then Layla, I like the secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity because it shows that future generations can change, adapt, interpret the constitution to current events. There, there's just a little sampling from the chat box those for you. Wonderful. So great guys, thank you for all those great insights. And isn't it interesting, you, the principles you identified are definitely rooted in the text, but they are broader structural pr principles or uh, principles of uh, government governance that are inferred or construed uh, from the text itself. Um, really uh, great. And I'm sure we could keep going. But so the, to, yeah, Nassant, yeah. points out, which I think is a perfect transition, that the constitution is meant to be a conversation. So isn't that a perfect transition to our civil dialogue conversation? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> I was like, wow, Nassant, you just knew what was coming next. So this next section, we're going to talk a little bit about a great conversation of I want to say five, six years ago, Jeff, Jeff had with Justice Breyer. And Justice Breyer shared with us kind of the big ideas that the court uses to ensure that they have civil dialogues. So for this next section, Jeff's going to kind of walk us through some of those big ideas of what are, how do you have a constitutional conversation? You place the constitutional question in front of you. You do your homework with what's in the constitution. Where is it? What's our history? And then you engage in a civil dialogue around it. And what are some of the, what we call the norms that a community can follow either on Zoom or in the Supreme Court or at your dinner table or at your breakfast table? Because that's usually where we do most of our talking in my house. And how do you, what are those norms that the court follows? And then what are the norms that you all follow and say, this is how I have a healthy civil dialogue online or in person or whatever way we meet up these days. So Jeff, you wanna kind of walk through Breyer's kind of big ideas? 
A absolutely. And um, just to, I hope we've teed it up by emphasizing that having a civil dialogue isn't important just because it's nice to be polite to each other and we should all sing Kumbaya. It's at the heart of the framers expectations for how the constitution would work or not. Um, Thomas Jefferson thought that we should all study the history of Greece and Rome because we'd see how corrupt governments fell when the people failed to be attentive and stand up for their own liberties. And he and James Madison and a bunch of the other framers thought that the only way that people could stand up for their own liberties and the only way that they could uh, deliberate with each other so that they could both pass, or their representatives could pass ordinary laws and ultimately they could decide whether or not to amend the constitution is by talking to each other, by listening to arguments on all sides, by settling their political disagreements in a deliberative manner. Deliberative means, you know, think before you speak. Um, don't just tweet out the fact that you're outraged by something, but uh, pause, um, listen, learn, learn, educate yourself about the facts before you make up your mind. Deliberation is all about being guided by the power of reason. And it's impossible to overstate how important reason was to the framers. These are uh, uh, citizens of the enlightenment who believe that we must all be guided by reason rather than passion. They didn't mean that we should never be passionate about standing up for what we believe in or even when necessary, taking up arms, having a right of revolution if we thought our liberties were being threatened. But they did believe, and they're getting this from the ancient Greeks and Romans, we should temper our unreasonable passions like anger, jealousy, hatred, which are not productive because they're, they don't allow us to be guided by reason. So it's a very, um, it's, it's modern, isn't it? I mean, we, we learned today about the importance of self-control, of using our minds to uh, focus ourselves, to, uh, to tune in and, and listen respectfully to each other. And this is all based on this enlightened idea of reason. So back to Justice Breyer, um, who is an extreme uh, example of a kind of uh, 20, an enlightenment uh, figure in the, in the 21st uh, century. Stay calm and listen to others read a lot. Gosh, you can't get better than that advice. He's I so know. right about that. It's so great. Everything so you just about. went through is what he said. He said they listen to each other. And so I was going through the slides as you were talking, because that's exactly what Justice Breyer said. And they, what I love, what I heard him say, and I've heard others say is, listen to learn, not listen to, to combat. So your job is to make your brain stop and say, I'm listening to hear what they're telling me. And I'm listening to learn from them. I'm not listening for a rebuttal. Um, and it was a really interesting way to do it. One of the techniques he shared with our students was that he writes it down when, when the other people in the court are speaking, he writes down what they're saying because that helps him listen to learn. Um, and I have to be honest that I was an adult listening to him telling this and I totally started using that rule and it's brilliant. It really does help you focus on what the person's saying. But the other thing that Jeff, you said, and he said, you got to read a lot. There's a lot of reading. <laughs> it's so true. Gosh, he summed up in whatever, you know, seven words what, what I used a whole lot more for, but it's, it's really true. And friends, Curry and I live and breathe the constitution. We love teaching it. We spend a lot of time thinking about it. I, I know, uh, Curry, I think we both think of ourselves as much learners, as teachers. And the more you learn, the more you realize that there's a whole lot more to read. And every time I log on to that interactive constitution, I find a new clause or a new Supreme Court case or a new whole series of, of philosophical foundations like uh, those in the Greek and Roman times that I hadn't learned before. So there's so much to read. And I hope you'll find this reading not a chore or a form of unwanted homework, but a, an excitement, uh, something that you'll want to do on your own and just pick topics you're interested in and go down those rabbit holes. And But read mindfully. We all know there's a difference between surfing and deep reading. So not just a quick Google or, and then you go to Facebook and you know back to Twitter, but read, if you're gonna read the Federalist Papers, dig in and take the time to read the whole number. You know, it, it takes a little time. Often for myself, I'll just share 
setting aside time for deep reading when I turn off email and turn off the browsing and just go into the book, whether it's an electronic book or a physical book, really is helpful for me. And the same for writing. So definitely read a lot. But then that crucial advice Justice Breyer gave, listen to the other side before you make up your mind. Have an open mind in these discussions. You've got to realize the questions we're going to be talking about in this class are so hard, so difficult, so contested. There are generally good arguments on both sides of most constitutional questions, which is why you have to read when you're reading opinions, the majority opinion and the concurrences and the dissents. The concurrences say, I agree with the majority, but for a different reason, the dissents say, I disagree. And before you can make up your own mind, you gotta hear those arguments on all sides and have a sense of humility. You know, there that, there's a great line from Judge Learned Ham, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that's not too sure it is right. This is such a overconfident time when on social media, both sides are so sure they know the right answer and the other sides are wicked or terrible or you know completely wrong. That's not the way the constitution works and that's not the way the Supreme Court works. And we're not gonna uh, model that in this class. We're gonna listen respectfully to all arguments. Um, you, you have Brand Justice Brandeis there and we can end with that, Curry, but do you wanna offer yeah. uh, some final thoughts? Just the two final thoughts. I, I know that some of our students find the, the reading uh, difficult. So remember, and we can, if you, you have our email, you have my email with every single class. If you need any tools that can support you in reading different levels of some of these materials or how to have your reader read for you. So that's like a great tool that I love. I like to listen to Audible and listen to these court cases. And now you can hear some of them online and have a tool that reads the pages for you. So you, if you get stumble on the words, don't worry. There's ways to get around that and still be able to listen in those pieces. But real quick, as we wrap up, and I'm going to let Jeff wrap up with the come uh, with the Brandeis quote because I know it's all of our favorites, but it's definitely one of his. But if you want to share in the chat any ways that you guys have used to kind of engage in healthy civil dialogues online or in class or at the dinner table, a couple of the ones that our students have shared with us. Um, that we have done online programs with. One of the ones was be present. This is one I absolutely love. Um, they said, be present. Make sure that you just exactly what you said, Jeff. Make sure that you turn things off and tune in and be present. Um, easy things like remember to shut up your mic when there's noises going on in the background. But it's okay to end the conversation with not knowing all the answers. That's okay. And that goes back to being humble. It's okay, we don't know all the answers and we're gonna try to find out more, but sometimes you just aren't 100% sure and that's very good. So feel free to share them in the chat box and Jeff, would you like to bring us home? Well, um, that wonderful uh, injunction to be humble, it's so humbling to learn about the constitution because there's so much passion, brilliance, power, justice, injustice, all of American history is contained in the debates over the constitution. Every political question, uh, the, the Tocqueville famously said, becomes a constitutional question. And to study the constitution is to study the whole history of America. It's to study what we disagree about, but also the ideals that unite us. And that's so inspiring in this very difficult polarized time to be able to have these ideals in common. Uh, Curry's write, read and learn however it works for you. Um, audible, reading out loud, reading together, Skimming is important too, you know, the, these Supreme Court opinions can be really long and you don't have to read every word. And of course, some of the legal jargon is intimidating, but I also want you to be quietly confident in your own abilities and know that you have the power if you devote the self-discipline to grasp the essential context by skimming through the jargony stuff and just tuning in with focused reading and listening so that you can get the essential context. And that's in doing that, you're exercising your powers of reason that the framers thought, like the Greeks and Romans, was a, well, they would have seen as a kind of spiritual quest. It was the highest thing that the mind of human beings was capable of, was to exercise their powers of reason. This incredible quotation from Justice Brandeis comes from the book of Isaiah. And uh, people called Justice Brandeis Isaiah because he was like an Old Testament prophet. And the book of Isaiah, like the Athenians and the Romans who Brandeis so admired, believe that the power of reason was the divine power in, in man. When we exercise our powers of reason, we are most, we are achieving our highest form of flourishing. 
So that's what I want you to do together to enter into this great conversation about the Constitution with humility, with enthusiasm, with uh, spirit, all in this wonderful idea, come let us reason together. Fantastic, what a great way to wrap it up. I wanna thank everybody for having an amazing day. Hope you guys have fun all season long with us. And remember this whole day and this whole week, we're going to be reason this whole year reasoning together. So thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you everybody there. Um, some great Great. comments in the chat. And let's put in a plug for joining us on Friday when we're gonna be joined by David Coleman, the president of the college board. The college board uh, puts together the advanced placement uh, classes and uh, the SAT. And David is a great uh, evangelist for the importance of studying the Constitution. And he and I are going to have a conversation about why studying the Constitution is exciting. So I hope you'll join us on Friday for the conversation with David Coleman. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a great day. I'm going to pause the recording now.